having us and having this really interesting talk today. This topic is very unique and very interesting. But before we start, a classic Captain Velo tradition is that we go around the room and we introduce ourselves. So with that said, go around, please say your name and the interest of yours and the stereotype that you have about charming Americans. Okay. Be honest, be brutal, that's totally okay. So share your thoughts, know your name, your interest, and a stereotype you have like that you can You look okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I brought her here because uh, I just moved here this week from LA and uh, Sarah, I'm an engineer, so that gives me. And the reason why I brought her here is because uh, when I was in LA, we used to host a similar convention, and we heard about it over there, and we sometimes go off and watch it on the stream. Uh, so I decided to check it out, and so here we are. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, my name is Jeffrey. I'm currently working on my um, PhD at Columbia. And, um, my stereotype in terms of what I'm very in China. Uh, every time you start speaking Chinese, you're then they're like, hey, you know, so with a Zhongle, you should have a call. <laughs> and then, like, okay, and then the conversation, the Chinese conversation ends, and you start talking. And then maybe the conversation will die off in one minute. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so well, that's kind of my stereotype. It is not true. Why are you here? I'm Jen. Hello. Uh, I heard about oh, oh. <laughs> I heard about this um, through Jenny and, uh, and Eric. Um, and I've also been hearing a lot about Kendrick Milo. Do you look the Nobody wants to be. Anyway, I've been hearing about it, like, you know, through friends that are also involved in the Chinese community. So excited to check it out. Um, uh, stereotypes. Uh, interest in stereotypes. Oh, interest? Um, I, I like music. And uh, on the opposite spectrum, I've started looking lately. So that's a new thing. Not very good at it, but I like it. <laughs> um, okay. And, um, uh, this is your type. Um, when you like eat your family, especially like your grandparents or whatever, like they keep on feeding you no matter what you say. <laughs> just keep on eating until they, you know, until they stop asking you. Okay. Um, those people say food. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, well, my name is Wei Chu. I'm from Taiwan. I'm Taiwanese. I just been here uh, already three months. I studied language uh, in Estonia school. And I just I want to uh, try the next degree uh, maybe this year. Uh, my English is not very good, so I can't get to classic my English. You are very good. You are very good. Yeah, I'm, I'm Charles as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 oh, it's interesting that it's very interesting about having Well, I'm part of Alex for Taiwan with Danny and Alex here, and we like talking about like Taiwan history and spreading the word about and educating others about it. That's something that we go doing. Um, stereotype, I think, is most or all having their uh, big weeks. <laughs> okay. Hi, Alex. Um, stereotype would be, I guess this is only for Taipei based people, but you ask somebody from Taipei, the final question is what subway stop you're offering? Um, yeah. Any interest? No interest. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Chin Chin. Um, I'm from Taiwan. So, yeah, it's good to meet you guys. Um, for the, stereo, the stereotypes of Taiwanese American, I feel like for most of Taiwanese American I, I met, they are kind of full of energy and uh, kind of feel, I feel them have confidence all the time. It's like, yeah. I guess that's it. Hi, my name is Xin uh, I'm volunteer for the Cafe Pilo. Um, uh, my stereotype for Chinese American. I feel like everyone has has shiny smile. I assume that everyone does both get braces before. Okay. <laughs> 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 My friend, my friend. Uh, I, I run a sports organization, so I'm interested in sports. Um, and uh, my stereotype, I think the foodie thing sounds about right. Every Taiwanese person, I'm the Taiwanese American person I know, is really, really into food. So. <laughs> uh, I'm, um, I'm Josh Young, and I've come from Taiwan. I have stayed here for five years. And I, I come here for Taiwan to make Taiwan
So I feel Taiwan will be a very smart. But we should have our very good future. That's why I try my best to come here as, well, as much as possible. I also do a lot of different and interesting things. Let's do it in my course server. And they say course server, people come with you and they stay in my course. Yeah, I have an uh, Airbnb. If you want to pay money, you can stay in my home. <laughs> you don't want to have money, I have a walk away. You can stay in my house. Yeah, help me to clean my house, my apartment, my Airbnb business, and you stay for free. So I do everything that I really need. And I will get a new office here, new walk. Yeah, I don't wish you need. That's a... Uh, I'm from Taiwan University, came back to here. All my life, I do make. <laughs> Yeah, I'm um, Hi, I'm William, and I'm here because Eric, the one Jake is my roommate, I'm here to support him. <laughs> um, we went to high school together in Taipei, in Taipei Grammar School. Oh, we really know um, My interest, like whoever you said, is food. <laughs> I work in a food startup, started from camp before, and worked at a restaurant before, so I really love food. And I mean, stereotype for Chinese people. I'm not really stereotype. I think every Chinese person has like 10 boxes of Feng Yisu and Uh, 
Uh, the stereotype I also do the electrical thing in every single town in the world is me and here, but they love me to do <laughs> Like, the people say, I feel like Americans think that town is just something every day, but you're a bubble tea in the bottom. <laughs> every day, so we are in the kitchen, like, making a box on this. We all have things like 70 hours. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm from um, an organization called TAP. Um, my interests are I, I like to organize a lot of events and parties. And oh, my stereotype is that Chinese Americans are not interested in politics. And my name is Jenny Wang. My interests include going on adventures and painting my nails. <laughs> Taiwan related things. I'm also a part of outreach for Taiwan with several individual groups around. And stereotype of Chinese Americans, I think, is that I think people in Taiwan think that Chinese Americans are probably fat because they think that we eat fasted every day. <laughs> 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 I think that's the stereotype people have the Chinese parents. So that was great going around, everyone talking about their background. Um, we had folks from LA, we had a magician in the room, we had someone that just moved here three months ago. And it's pretty cool to see such a diverse people in the same room. But we all have one thing in common, and that one thing in common is that we are interested in Taiwan. Right? So this happy Hilo. It's going to be about outreaching to Chinese Americans. The Chinese American experience is one that is very beautiful, one that is very interesting, and one that is also very unique. So our three speakers here today all represent one organization in the New York City Chinese American community, and they will share their thoughts about how they outreach to young Chinese Americans. And Alex Shi will be the first. Yeah. 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 Uh, social events and cultural events. Um, so I'm not saying it makes me an expert on this topic. Um, these are just like my views and thoughts. Um, I do a lot of generalizations in here, but hopefully it's sort of interesting and um, and uh, and humorous, and it sort of comes to a conclusion that's relatively basic, but like we hopefully will all find sort of a, at least sort of interesting or good to talk. So I want to start with like uh, sort of from sort of my my experience. As a, as a second or third generation Taiwanese American, my mom was born um, in Long Island and she grew up in, in the US. Uh, like, you know, I uh, cruise the average Taiwanese American just again based on uh, my work with TAP and like my own upbringing. So, first, uh, who is the average Taiwanese American? We sort of talked about this. They're well educated, um, they have a stable job. Um, so, this is sort of like the makeup of our organization, Tap New York. We've got a lot of people in finance, a lot of people in technology, fashion, healthcare, law, a lot of things that we talked about already. Um, they read the news, um, <laughs> and that is not only this sort of news, like Time Magazine, but also like New York Times and um, things like that. I read New York Times and CNN on an iPad and American politics and things like that. Um, they travel a lot, so we hear a lot of people here like travel, um, including to Taiwan. A lot of Taiwanese Americans love going back, maybe for clothing, maybe for eating. <laughs> and they like to relax and party. Uh, they like to watch Asian dramas and they like to go out. They also like to watch Netflix and other things like that. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to touch on was like what matters to Taiwanese Americans. So, first one is Jeremy Lin. <laughs> All Taiwanese Americans like Jeremy Lin on Facebook. <laughs> Money and fame is a 
important for a lot of times Americans to get really rich or to be famous. Which is something that, again, this is all sort of generalizing, but it's something that probably a lot of us in the room would agree with as common Americans. Um, next one is family. So a lot of us, um, a lot of my friends and Chinese Americans go home a lot and see their parents, or they hope their parents come visit them. They live close by, and like raising a family and having kids themselves. Um, the next one is fun, so it's sort of like this saying: so partying and hanging out with friends and watching TV. Um, and the next thing is enrichment, which is like just learning more in general about things, anything. It could be about Taiwan, it could be about um, Trump, it could be about you know whatever they work in, any sort of industry. It could be about sports. And the last one is like being part of the group. And I think this is pretty um, common actually for everyone, not just Chinese Americans, but um, everyone wants to be a part of the group. Um, it's something that makes you feel good, it makes you feel like you have friends. Um, it's pretty much, it's sort of like a human nature kind of thing for people who want to be part of something. And that's sort of what my organization, CAP, does do, is create the sense of community and group. Uh, all right, so as a sort of quick summary of what the two slides that we just looked at, you see that Taiwanese Americans are well-educated, they have a stable job, they read the news, they travel, they relax and party, and they care about things like Jeremy Lin, money, family, fun, enrichment, and identity or being part of the group. So what does that sort of like bring us as a conclusion? Um, when I look at a lot of these things, it's like, um, you know, you, well, if you're well educated and you're Taiwanese, you probably are do have an interest in Taiwan as a Taiwanese American. Um, if you read the news then, and you're Taiwanese, you probably are interested in Taiwan. Uh, if you travel to Taiwan, whether it be for partying or for family or for novelty, you are interested in Taiwan. Uh, if you're interested in Jeremy Lake, you're obviously in Taiwan. Um, your family is Taiwanese or Chinese American, um, you are interested in Taiwan. Um, enrichment and identity. I mean, being Taiwanese is part of your identity. You know, it's something you can't really change about yourself as a Taiwanese American. Um, and enrichment is just generally learning more about stuff, and that includes about Taiwan. So what I'm trying to say here is that a lot of people think that Taiwanese Americans actually aren't interested in Taiwan at all, or they're just interested in like, partying, or drinking, or having bubble tea, or going to night markets. But I don't think that's the case. Um, and having talked to a lot of Taiwanese Americans. You know, just through TAP and myself, um, there's there's a lot of interest in Taiwan in general. Yeah, we all enjoy those sorts of things like drinking and whatever. But in the end, Taiwanese Americans are well educated. They're interested in enrichment, enrichment and learning more about you know their, themselves and being part of the group. And that, by default, makes everyone interested in Taiwan beyond you know public. But at the same time, I think a lot of us would agree that. Taiwanese Americans, they don't go out of their way to learn more about Taiwan, like politics, or culture, or things like that. And I asked myself, sort of like, why is that? And part of it is like, I think that Taiwanese Americans aren't being taught about Taiwan in the right way. Right? So they, there's this interest in the back of everyone's head, but they're not really getting the information in the right way or in a way that's interesting. So that begs the question, right? How does Taiwanese Americans? Young Chinese Americans want to learn about, right? If we're not delivering the message, if the message isn't being delivered to them the right way, then what's the right way to do it? Because there, there is a spark, right? They are interested, but how do we get them to translate that interest into actually wanting to learn about it and doing something about learning? So I just thought about some ways that Chinese Americans generally think about. So quick and fun, right? So they don't like being lectured to. As ironic as that is. <laughs> but, they don't like being lectured to. They don't want something that's, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to go back to college because they're busy, they have a job. They want to see things that are funny. They want presentations that are real fast. So what does that mean? It's like things like Instagram, okay, that are going to get Taiwanese Americans actually interested in Taiwan. Like it's quick content, you're scrolling your thing, um, and it's, it's, it's super fast. Um, so, and it's a photo, you know, everyone likes to get photos. It's fun and it's fast. Next thing that they don't like, or that they <laughs> want to learn, is people like me. 
they, they want to learn from people like them. Okay, so they don't want to be they like seeing materials or information about Taiwan and that's poorly written or in poor English or poor grammar. That's not going to fly with Taiwanese Americans. That's not how they want to learn. The second thing that I want to point out is about um, their parents. You know, like young people don't like to hear about things from their parents generally. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's just, it's just like it's like it's normal. Like you know, like my, your parents are always like, don't go out. You want, you want to go out. Obviously, it's pretty normal to want to hear from somebody different, from, different from your parents, similar to you, that shares the same values. So what does that mean? It means that when information about Taiwan is presented to young Taiwanese Americans, it's got to look good. This is supposed to say great design should be shared. Um, <laughs> it's got to look good, it's got to be compelling, it's got to be written well, and it has to be of high quality. Otherwise, Taiwanese Americans just aren't going to look at it. And then the last thing is they want to be able to form their own opinion. Right. Taiwanese Americans have heard so much from their parents or whatever about green, blue, red, blue, whatever. And that's not how Taiwanese Americans want to learn. They're afraid of green and blue. Okay, they want to be able to see the facts themselves and then they want to be able to make their own opinion about it. So what does that mean? It means that information has to be presented to them and then they have to be the ones to make the interpretations and have the conversations about it and do their own research. Because again, they are interested it's just that they have to be learning it the right way and the, the information has to be presented to them the right way. Yeah, so that was okay. Yeah, so that's it. Any questions, I guess? Or do you want any questions later? No questions. Oh, you want to do it later? No, we do it now. Okay. Um, so, so I'm Chinese American, I'm born here. Um, I, I've always felt like it, it you know, um, I'm ironic you said that parents, the kids don't like listening to their parents. I think at a certain age, sure, but the people who I know who are politically active or politically interested are ones who parents were. And that check sort of, you know, goes, trickles down to them. Uh, my parents are not, not no interest whatsoever. So I was not raised with any political interest. So yeah. I didn't really hear about anything until I was in college and, and uh, you know, hearing it from other Taiwanese Americans who were politically interested. Yeah. So, um, so there's, there's, there's that, you know, there's already a fundamental disinterest yeah. to start from, from, from someone like me growing up. Yeah, it's interesting, like, I mean, again, these are all generalizations, so it's really hard, it's hard, like, so, from my experience, like, I didn't grow up with anything about someone, like, my mom was born here, and she speaks English, like, we speak English at home, my, my mom doesn't really speak Chinese very well, and my dad came here when he was seven, like, 16 or 17, so he went to college and everything. Um, and like it was sort of like I didn't hear about it from me and then from, from them and I actually like I had an interest in it um, just like based on the internet and things like that. So I think it can go it's you know, you can go either way. Um, I think that the general thesis still stays the same that information has to be presented to them in the right way. But you know, for every case is obviously different. It's gonna depend on So I guess what well, my question is what what age or what is it that you say, how should it be presented? Is this unique to each individual? Do you have to find a way based on the subjects that you that you brought up, essentially, to kind of like find some way in? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good question. I mean, it's probably a mixture of both, honestly, which is a cop-out answer, but, <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but, but like, it is, it's, it's part individual, I think, like how does, it's, the idea is like to get you thinking about like how, how does an individual, I guess, want to, want to, Want to be presenting information right. and um, and sort of cater tailor to that. So I think. Sorry, I'm just gonna. I just want to just just throw this out there because it can be answered by by everybody going forward. But the idea to me was always like, uh, as a Taiwanese American, hearing about Taiwan was kind of almost like a Taiwanese person hearing about America. I don't really know that much about Taiwan. I, I re, my family didn't really go back at all. So it's like hearing about it is like a place that represents. A heritage and culture, but it's not something I really know. So when like Taiwanese hear about America, some place that they want to go, something that's interesting for them, but not some place they really feel any true political connections to, especially. Like how many Taiwanese are here really care about what's happening in American politics? Similarly to what Taiwanese Americans really care about what's happening in Taiwanese politics. You know, there's already American politics in like 
worry about, right? So how do we get integrated to thinking about what's going on over there? I think that's the, the hardest part. Of yeah, it's, it's hard. I mean, I think that, you know, it, it's um, it's like, you know, you, you look at it like, you, like, I am Taiwanese and American, so it's sort of my, my not responsibility, but it makes, you know, as an educated and learned individual, I should want to be interested in both. That's sort of my initial answer. But I don't know if that is. I'm sorry. The last part. Of the, <laughs> the last part is that Taiwan seems to be. I know there, that it's it's there's a lot going on. You know, um, that's kind of under the, not not under the table, but not recognized widely. Right? There's a lot of things going on not recognized widely. But for the average layperson who's Taiwanese American, things in Taiwan look like they're, they're fine. It's not like we're not talking about what's happening in like Ghana and Sudan. You know what I mean? When you think back about helping these kind of countries, these are causes that you show images of. And it's very visceral reactions, and it's like very easy to jump on board and say, I want to be part of solving this kind of political problem. But in Taiwan, things seem to be going okay for the Taiwanese people. So that's another thing to think about as far as how to get people involved in a country that seems to be doing a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it depends on, on I guess, what you want individual missions. Like, how, how like, do you want to, like, does Taiwan need humanitarian aid, or is it just a responsibility as Taiwanese Americans to learn more about it? And, you know, maybe you don't necessarily drop everything and show up there to do, you know, relief or something like that. But it is, you know, to what extent as an individual, to what extent do we want to motivate individuals to learn more about it in general? Yeah, sure. So it's something that I think we need to work on, but I think. The most overarching thing that I would say about our organization is that um, you know, we exist, which, is, which, which sounds like a bad answer, but um, <laughs> but I really I really believe in it, and um, we give I, I see it as we've created one large community and a lot of communities within communities, um, Taiwanese Americans helping each other out, Taiwanese Americans becoming friends, and. Uh, we're trying to work on something that sort of showcases all that right now, but it's just like taking a long time. Um, but having, being able to create that community under the, the uh, idea that we are a Taiwanese American, I think is, is a lot bigger thing than, than one might realize. And I think in a world without Taiwanese American professionals or other organizations like TaiwaneseAmerican.org, we're not a reach for someone, in, in, in a world without them, I think that a lot of people would be would you know call themselves something different or not care as much? Um, so that's really like the overall general thing that I see from a very high level. Um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a more micro level, um, it's again like creating that community. Um, but on, on a more micro level, I think it's being able to share parts of culture that you know the normal Taiwanese American would be interested in, but they don't necessarily. Um, have access to. So for example, if we're going to do an event about, uh, even if it's some food, right, that like we want to create a draw up, a lead behind or a postcard or even a printout that has more information about it in the background and history and things like that. Um, and again, it's something that we have to work on a lot. Um, it's like difficult when we all have full-time jobs and doing all these like, other events that people want to see. But um, these are definitely things that are important to us and, and our minds. Um, and I mean, even creating things in like Tommy's brands, um, working with the Tommy's embassy, the thing um, that's pretty close to here, um, that all I think letters up to our So I think it's it's a uh, on very high level. It's like I said, it's creating that overall community, and on a more micro level, it's um, it's doing things that people are going to be interested in and have a lot of fun at and be interested in coming out to. And also making it um, relevant to Taiwan. Any other questions or thoughts? Aha moment. Okay, thank you, Alex. Around. I have to go back to the office at some point, unfortunately. Um, but 
uh, I'll try and stick around in like chat. So there is an interesting history between Taiwan and Taiwanese Americans that's not present in other, uh, you know, cultures. So, you know, hinging off what Alex said, you know, one of the stereotypes is it's sometimes we'll talk to Taiwanese Americans about Taiwan issues and politics. Uh, and the three buckets that I'm just going to quickly talk about, you know, is the lack of knowledge, um, the life influences that shape Taiwanese American lives and the challenges with the Taiwanese American identity. So, some of these are pretty, you know, common sense, but when you think, so Taiwanese Americans on average know very little about Taiwan. And I know people already know that, but I think whatever you think, however much you think Taiwanese Americans know about Taiwan, take that and like, you know, <laughs> take it like several notches low. And I think even Taiwanese people don't realize, like for instance, like when I'm in Taiwan, my parents are like, oh, you're American, you're American, you don't know anything. And then they'll talk about something, and I'll be like, oh, I don't know what they did. They'll be like, you don't know? How do you not? I'm like, you just don't know. You're an idiot in America. You know? So I think there's this weird like, duality where I'm like, people in Taiwan, Taiwanese people, no Chinese Americans know shit. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they don't really know. You know? Um, and it, it goes way back. So, number one, family. Alex just on this. Um, 
there are cultures that are very good at passing on cultural heritage to the next generation. They have many years of experience, and they're good at it. Chinese culture is not one of them. <laughs> Two, in the U.S., the Taiwanese uh, parents have been reticent about passing on the heritage to the next generation for many of the reasons that you guys already know. You know, whether it was fear from what they experienced in Taiwan, or you know, not wanting to think about their memories in Taiwan. Um, Recently, one of my friends went back to Taiwan in January, and his mom was like, why are you so interested in going back to Taiwan? Like, what, what is so great here? He's like, mom, you're Taiwan. He's like, don't you have good memories of Taiwan? And his mom was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. She's like, all I remember about Taiwan was being poor and being stressed about not being the top of the class at school. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, oh, OK. Well, you know, so, and you know, lastly, and this may be something not to talk about, a lot of the first generation Taiwanese, like my parents' era, I mean, sadly, not some of them don't know much about Taiwan. You know, like when they left Taiwan in the 50s, 60s, 70s, they left an era of oppression. The education was kind of messed up. So a lot of them, too, like, you know, knowing something is different from knowing it enough to explain it. You know, I'm sure a lot of you maybe have that experience. If you ask your parents something about Taiwan, they're like, oh, what? This is vegetable where it comes from. And, I have so many things where my parents will argue, but they're like, oh, they have to think about it. You know, they're like, oh, I think this fruit comes from, and then my dad will contradict my mom, and he'll be like, no, no, that's not right. It's actually this. And then I'll look at the internet, and like, they're both wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think, and you know, I used to do the reverse. They're like, you guys are Taiwanese. <laughs> you don't know. I mean, what, where am I from? So I think the, you know, those three factors for family, it all leads to how many Americans knowing less about Taiwan than their fellow Asian Americans, as in Japanese, Korean, et cetera. Um, community. This one is something a little more undercover, I think, because what is the number one way people learn about culture? What? I would say is seeing a group of them interact, okay? And so let me tell you, when there's a big migration of Taiwanese people immigrating here to where they went, Wisconsin, Kansas, Tennessee, like Nova Scotia, <laughs> how many, this is, for those of you who grew up in Taiwan, it might be hard for you to, to picture this, but for a Chinese person growing up and never ever seeing a group of more than 200 Taiwanese people ever until the age of 18 sometimes. Like I don't mean, I was the only Asian Taiwanese person in my entire town in New Jersey. We had to drive six hours round trip every year to a town of just to see a group of Taiwanese people more than 200. So like, other than that, it's just like, and so what that does for a lot of Taiwanese Americans, especially if you grew up in the 80s, 70s, 90s, and like kind of isolated, not the only Taiwanese, the only Asian, is that, for instance, you just, there's so much you don't know. You don't see like a large Taiwanese families interact, parties, weddings out in the street. So like if your mom does something, you think it's super strange. You're like, oh my god, mom. But then you see her go to a conference and you're at other Taiwanese people and you're like, oh my god, my mom's not strange. She's Taiwanese. <laughs> like, it just all makes sense. You know, like why she's on the floor punching another woman for the chat. You know? <laughs> but, like old Taiwanese people get there and talk about their 2080 illnesses. You know, oh, you're still always working. Right? You know, like, oh yeah, my life is work to like all these things suddenly click when you see it in a group. And unfortunately, a lot of times people grow up without, you know, that. Um, and the last thing is English language resources. Uh, there, there just aren't a lot of resources about Thailand. It ain't France, it's not Mexico. It's really hard to get information if you don't care from your family. But I really want to replace this with um, going to Taiwan. I know Alex said Taiwanese Americans love to visit Taiwan. We do. We absolutely freaking love it. But you know what? Sadly, not a lot of us get to. Now, I know a ton of my Taiwanese American friends have never been to Taiwan except for the time when they were a baby and their parents took them to Taiwan to see grandma. <laughs> you know, like, that's, not, that's not something you can, and let me tell you, this makes me very sad. There is no substitute to spending time in Taiwan to learn about Taiwan. There is no substitute, no negotiation. No. It's like night and day. So that's what you're dealing with when you meet your average Taiwanese American and you're like, you know, well, what do you know about Taiwan? That this this is where it comes from. <laughs> so, 
Um, and the second section I'll call the fresh off the boat syndrome. <laughs> you know, like Alex mentioned, you know, Asian Americans, Chinese Americans. A lot of times I hear Taiwanese people, they try to talk about Chinese Americans, about politics, and it doesn't resonate with them. They don't get it, it's not part of their personal lives. And, you know, it, it, this is why. Because the Taiwanese American experience in the US is largely the immigrant, second generation immigrant experience. And it can be very traumatic. Um, I think for people who are from Taiwan, it may be hard to imagine, like, growing up, and never seeing anyone on TV who looks like you, or you know, being one of the only Asian people in school, and people like make fun of your parents, or no, the worst is when they—it's not when they make fun of your parents. It's like when you can feel they think your parents are strange, or their English is not so good. And like as a kid, like even if people don't voice it, you feel it very clearly, you know, and. There is little like more painful than being like ashamed of your parents or wishing you're from a different family or you know and th these are all things that are voiced by Asian Americans you know and so a lot of these experiences mark Chinese Americans and but these experiences are not Chinese Americans experiences they're Asian experiences so it's difficult to you know, reach them on a specifically Taiwanese level sometimes because their lives have been so largely um, shaped by Asian experience. And I'll give a good example. Um, there is an award-winning Taiwanese American children's author who was spotlighted by the White House this year. And in her TED talk, she mentioned the she was in elementary school in an all-white school. Uh, she was dying, everyone was dying to be the star of the school play with her boss. Everyone wanted to be Dorothy. And everyone in the playground, jumping up and down, she's nine years old, she's like, do you guys think I'm a Dorothy? Do you think I have a chance? And her friends turned to her and she said, they say, you can't be Dorothy, you're Chinese. Now Dorothy isn't Chinese. And in her TED talk, like, you can say, see, she still remembers this, like 40 years, like, <laughs> just like, the heart, you know, just like, he had been suddenly told, like, you do not belong, you cannot be, you know, and that sense of, like, it marked her to the point where she went on to write the first middle school series starring a Taiwanese American girl and, you know, puts it in her young adult novels because she never wants another little girl like her to feel that way in the future, you know? And now she identifies as Taiwanese American and Chinese American and Asian American. You know, her identity is a little fluid, you know, but whatever her reasons, you know, and it's it's all, you know, it's her personal narrative. But it's also because of her experience is, you know, generally Asian American. And that, that is true for a lot of high profile Taiwanese Americans in, in all sorts of industries, which I could go on about. Um, so, uh, so after all that, like not having a lot of knowledge about Taiwan from the childhood, the other aspect is general identity of Taiwanese American uh, identity. I mentioned this before, but one of the Taiwanese Americans are probably the only identity in the world where you can really challenge them. You know, if someone says, I'm French American, I'm Mexican American, whatever, it's like, okay. But for Taiwanese Americans, at some point in your life, you're going to be challenged with, you know, what is that? You mean you're Chinese? Or, you know, you're going to get, and not only that, you won't get those challenges and questions from strangers, or you're going to get them from your friends, your family, your classmates, you know, sometimes your best friends. And, you know, often at a young age when you're not you know, ready to deal with it. Um, just to end with an example, uh, I, my, when my cousin was nine years old growing up in Long Island, she came home to me crying, and she was like, all the girls, when I said I was Taiwanese in class, all the girls told me that you were Chinese, you know, because she's the only Taiwanese girl in the class. And she was like, I don't, I didn't know what to say. You know, they were just so short. They were like, oh, no, no, you're Chinese. And, she was like, what could I have done? And I was five years older than her, and I, I didn't know. You know, it's 
these are very tough questions to ask, you know, for Taiwanese Americans to have at a young age. Um, and it's something that other fellow Asian Americans don't uh, face. You know, like, Korean American friend who knows no Korean, never been to Korea, hates K-pop, <laughs> um, you know, has no Asian friends, and they're Korean American, whatever, you know, it's boring, move on. For some reason, being Taiwanese American and this current era means that you are Taiwanese American. You know, it's like a state, whatever that is. So it, it's difficult uh, for doing that. So, I mean, I mentioned a lot of issues, but the point is everyone's a different journey. So, just some of my conclusions, the same talk with Alex is, uh, you know, this is especially, I want to say, for the Taiwanese American community. It's just embrace the diversity of the Taiwanese community. And I think it's easy to forget that I have a different space in their because working with Taiwanese American Network, I can't tell you the number of times where I've seen young Taiwanese Americans online be so excited about Taiwan. Like, yes, go Taiwan! Only to be cut down by other people in the Taiwanese American community. For instance, some people, like when they're rooting for Taiwan for sports or something, they'll like post the Taiwan flag. Yeah. And on Twitter, like the Taiwanese flag, I think automatically appears if you do something anyway. So they'll be like, "Yes, go Taiwan!" And then someone will write back like, "Um, that's you know, that's a shitty flag. You don't don't." Do <laughs> and then they'll be like, "Oh," and they'll be very confused. You know, because you realize you're dealing with people that don't know a whole lot. So they were so happy about Taiwan, and all of a sudden, someone's like, "No, you're wrong. You know, like, what are you doing?" Or, you know, we'll post an article about Taiwan being um, an ideal model for recycling, you know? Like, so, and so I'll post that, and then some Taiwanese people were marked like, oh, actually, Taiwan is very polluted. And, you know, if you saw the amount of plastic they used at the night market, you know, at the restaurants to cover the plates. <laughs> it's like, yes, we understand that everyone has their view, and, but, you know, give. Give people time to, to come into their identity, to, to learn on their own. Um, and the second thing is, you know, I think Alex addressed some of this, and it is difficult, you know. How do you reach people, especially as Ren mentioned, when they've reached age, a certain age, and they haven't uh, found their Taiwanese, you know, what found it important part of their makeup, yeah, they would. I mean, I would just say, you know, tell your Taiwanese story. And, and you tell your real town story because I think oftentimes we just say, tell the, the service story. You know, because if people ask me why I do what I do for Taiwan, it's not because of democracy, it's not because I love my parents, although I do love my parents. You know? um, but one of my real town stories is that when I was nine years old at a Taiwanese conference, my mom pointed to this other girl who was nine years old and she said, Go over to that corner and talk to that girl. And I was really shy. So I was like, I don't talk to her. My mom was like, you go over and talk to her. Because her father was a famous democracy activist and journalist in Taiwan. And when he wrote something about Taiwan, the police came for him and he set himself on fire and he died. So you go over and talk to that girl. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Um, but that makes me stay with me because even at a young age, like, I could not imagine how someone it could be that bad that someone would set themselves on fire. Or they have to for writing you know, um, And that's how all my life I've been preoccupied with telling the stories of people I've been next to have or the stories that get on the you know? So that's one of my real um, family stories. So I think. If you, you know, if people tell more of that, it'll resonate more with Chinese Americans and Americans in general. You know, like democracy, cross race relations, you know, civil rights. That's all great and good. You know, but when reaching people, it's, the, the personal stories also work too. Um, and then lastly, as you know, Alice pointed to, there's many different ways to advocate for Taiwan. 
And you know, activism doesn't always mean politics. Uh, I would say that Jeremy Lin and Fresh Off the Bone single-handedly put the word Taiwanese more times in English media than I don't know anything ever could. <laughs> so, and, and neither of those are like, you know, very focused on these Taiwanese people. They just are. Even though I'm not Taiwanese American, I actually grew up in Taiwan. Uh, so I was there from five years to uh, college. So, I mean, I, this may not speak for everyone who grew up in Taiwan, but if you think Taiwanese American knew this much about Taiwan, uh, Taiwanese probably knew this much. Um, unless they were born after the 90s and they went to the school with proper education, because things back then were pretty screwed up. And I, I feel like um, you know, the, the whole time that I grew up, growing up, everything was misplaced, misspelled, or, or just you, you get gaps everywhere else, and and that that kind of explains why we have such a not a problem, but just issues we have to solve and, and to kind of integrate all these. Like for example, the um, the journalist that you were talking about, yeah. I never heard about his name until you know, I was 24 and then looked it up in school, and then that that's how I learned about it. So there were so many things that you know, growing up, that we should have known. Away from us. And at the same time, we were fed with information that kind of just make, make sure, you know, keeping uh, us on the right track to be disinterested in air, uh, things surrounding us, whether it's politics, whether it's social issues, things like that. And, and I, I think it's very important today that we're here to kind of share different sides of the stories with different perspectives. And so we'll hopefully figure out a way that we can all work together, whether it's activism or whether it's sharing our different life stories and experience, and then you know, promote and, and hopefully solve some of the mysteries that we all have. And concerning those gaps you mentioned too, another side of that too is the uncertainty surrounding a lot of it's hard enough for Taiwanese people to understand their own history, let alone explain it to someone else. Right. <laughs> it's I, very tough. Yeah, and I feel like it's a double problem with Taiwanese Americans. They already know it's so little, thing. and then also everything's so uncertain. Like, nothing is certain in Taiwanese culture. Not the flag, not the name of the country, <laughs> not, you know, not even the food. Like, I did a Taiwanese food madness, and people were already there like, Oh, don't go for that food. It's really a Chinese food. Go for the Taiwanese <laughs> food. And I was like, it's food. <laughs> and you know, I feel like every time the Taiwanese American, a lot of things in Taiwanese culture, it's like water. You know, as soon as you touch something, it's like, oh, that's not really Taiwanese, or it's not really this. It's really this. You know, even status quo is like water. Like it's taken me twenty years to understand status quo. I don't know how anyone would explain it to a Taiwanese American. You know, American even in 20 minutes. <laughs> and I do think the most precious part is it's such a small island, but it integrates so many different cultures and so many different types of people. The, the fact that we have to discuss and figure out which is part of which, you know, we have all the 14 different Aboriginal tribes where in the Iowa school we have 10. And so things are just constantly changing, but then it also means we have to follow up and keep understanding more about the people. Rather than just sticking to what we think is fact, we just you know, think we knew everything. It's actually sometimes a good thing, even though it's dramatic at times, but to keep on learning more about yourself. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up diversity too, because I think it's important for us to keep an open mind on what the talent is and that Like, I can, can't tell you how many times I've been in Taiwan and I've been with people that are excited about being Taiwanese, and then someone posts a poll and they're like, oh, your parent is from X. Or oh, you speak Y, or you're from C. That's not really Taiwanese, and it's actually a little hard for you because then you will see the young Taiwanese American kind of pull back, like, oh, I thought I was Taiwanese American, but now you know I'm getting the idea. And I think it's because the Taiwanese identity is pretty new. Like even people in Taiwan are trying to breathe what it is, and so sometimes it's easy for all of us to kind of project our opinions, like, hey, how many people do this? You don't do this, you're not really Taiwanese. And especially for Taiwanese Americans whose identity is already so fragile, like it, it breaks very right? easily. Yeah. So that, that's also the danger of Taiwanese Americans. Does anyone else have any thoughts?
Uh, thank you for your sharing. I think your um, like, uh, the presentation, your presentation is very interesting. Like it's, it's fascinating to hear that like how diverse your um, uh, the Taiwanese American experience. Is. Um, um, I just I just think uh, I'm thinking. So, uh, as a Taiwanese here, I often I, I will be asked uh, like, oh, what do you mean you're a Taiwanese or, or actually you're Chinese or um, so I think we, we share some of these experiences, like this confusion. Um, um, and, um, and that I'm thinking maybe it mirrors the, the difficulties or the challenges of the nation building in Taiwan. So uh, although Taiwan might, uh, although Taiwan doesn't have a humanitarian crisis like Sudan or something, but even though the crappiest country on the world, like they torture their people or they have genocide or massacre. They have a seat in the United Nations and they are recognized as a country. So it's still, I feel like um, as a Taiwanese here, I constantly feel that like my identity or uh, is something like missing or it's not complete because actually um, most of, sometimes I feel like I really, I really feel that Taiwan is not a country, like it's not recognized. You just feel like, okay, some part of me is not recognized. <laughs> so, um, I think that's, yeah, I think it's um, neuros, like, yeah, why Taiwanese uh, Americans so difficult to deal with this, like, there are many confusions in there. Because yeah, we inherit some of that. Yeah, yeah. And I hope to make you feel better that I do think though that you, I never thought about that, that the Taiwanese identity could be uncertain because yeah, the, United, the United Nations. Yeah. <laughs> the whole name of Taiwan is such a loaded, like, political issue. Yeah. 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 Is being stepped in the right direction because like, there's there's so much pressure in the world to eliminate this idea of Taiwan. And it's not even like the country's name, like the country is technically the Republic of China. So anyone who's like who sees Taiwan like in their opinion as its own country already, it's it's it, it's kind of a political thing that they have to kind of be ready to uh, understand it and defend it. And, you know, in terms of that Taiwanese like, identity uncertainty, I mean, for you, I'd also say that, um, you know, for Taiwanese people, like, you know, really appreciate and savor that you actually know how that you grew up and lived in Taiwan, because that gives you a confidence and knowledge of Taiwan that I can't ever be with you. You know, like, how did Americans spend the first 20, 30, they'll never get to that point, never, you know? And I think that's, the, like, going back to her point, I had a Taiwanese friend who I was, uh, I was like, oh, when people ask me questions about being Taiwanese American, what does it mean? What, what do I say to them? I had so much angst when I was a teenager. And he was like, God, I'm going to talk to you. He was like, you just tell them, look, you go to Taiwan, go to China, talk to Taiwanese people, not Chinese people. It's different. End the story. <laughs> you know, and I was like, that's, if that's your advice. <laughs> But many years later, I know what he means. Because when you grow up in a place, when you did something, when you walk there, you have that comment. like, I'm Taiwanese. You know, my job. But... <laughs> 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 what do you want to say? You want to say, say, I'm Korean. Like, what? What? I'm Korean because I like John Chay. You know, there's no, there's no Excel spreadsheet. That when you are something, you, are, you don't need to talk about it. <laughs> I think that's what Taiwanese people like. I really love that they have, and I wish some more Taiwanese Americans. This is why Taiwanese Americans have all these conferences that literally the same workshop over and over again. Like, what does it mean to be Taiwanese? Like, what food do Taiwanese people eat? What do Taiwanese parents do? Got you. <laughs> it's very like ABC because we don't have that solid foundation 
So I think the United Nations thing it's it's an ongoing issue and it's not you know, but at least too that aside from the UN, you have your heart and your experience in Taiwan and no one can take that away from you. So I think that's also kinds of Taiwanese American experiences. This entire spectrum of them. Just, you know, through the three of us, our different organizations talk about very different things. And so I was like, what am we going to talk about? And I went to sleep at 3 a.m. and was like, I'm going to just talk about my organization. Essentially, somewhere in the mid-ground of Taiwanese American-ish. You know, a little bit clearly. So, I mean, the first thing I wanted to ask is, um, how, um, I want to kind of raise your hands. Um, can you raise your hands if you say if you are a Taiwanese? Um, like Taiwanese born? I mean, if, he, if, he, if, if someone just goes like, "You are, uh, are you Taiwan?" Like, well, if someone asks like, "Um, what are you?" What would you answer? If you're gonna answer, "I'm Taiwanese," raise your hand. Raise up. Keep it up. And then keep it up if you can all, or you also say, I am American too. And then, all right, now everyone put their hands down again. What if someone asks you, are you American? How many people are going to say, raise your hand if you're going to say yes. Now keep your hands up if you're going to say that you're Taiwanese as well. So, I mean, the, the idea is that there, there's a very, there's a very unique, <laughs> but the, the main thing that I want to say was that Taiwanese Americans, with the term itself, or even Asian Americans in general, it's a, it's an adjective with a noun. Taiwanese Americans, bottom line, you think with the adjective, you become American, right? And hence, it works for anything else. You can be Taiwanese American, Chinese American, you can be Tao, uh, you know, American Taiwanese if you, if you want. We're just talking about a lot of Canadians going to Taiwan. They can hear it. Canadian Taiwanese, you know, that's weird as it might sound. Um, so, the topic I want to talk about today is essentially how to talk to people who are interested. Um, as I was looking up, you know, you are, people are interested in it, and then you go, okay, I want to know about it, let me in. The question is, how do you start talking to it? Do you start going like, you know, you hear a lot of times, a lot of Taiwanese people just go like, oh, well, that's not our flag. Well, that's not our name, you know, that's not the language we speak. The question is, how do you get into that? So with Outreach for Taiwan, um, Jenny and I co-founded it um, two, two years ago. Um, the main question is, like, how do you hook Taiwanese Americans and what they care about, link it with um, the Taiwanese experience? Let's say, I remember the first time, the couple of experiences I had were to talk to Americans about Taiwan. Same question arises. How, how do you talk? We can go up to someone like, hey, let's talk about Taiwan. Like, hey, you know, this flag is not the right flag. Like, no, that's not the right way. I mean, talk to people, teach them how to outreach, saying, like, if you see their phones, you, know, like you're, you look at them, they're like, oh, this guy's a techie. This guy, probably programs, probably engineer, you know. Like, oh, like, you know, uh, what kind of computer do you have? It's like, oh, um, I have a, I have an Acer computer. Like, oh, well, that's how we make it, you know. And that's your segue into it. 
And there's so many different ways into it. Even like, let's say someone's Asian, or talking to Taiwanese Americans, there's a lot of Taiwanese Americans who love, say like, watching dramas or seeing KTV that you know, these Taiwanese songs. They be like, well, you talk about Mando pop, Mandarin pop, C pop, whatever you want to call it. The main ones that are coming out of it are from Taiwan. And people are like, well, that's music. Music, music, politics, history, is politics, history. But I'm like, well, it's different. There's a reason why 1.5 million versus 23 million, almost all the major Chinese pop, Mando pop stars are from Taiwan. It's because there was that, that freedom of duration, that freedom to express themselves musically. And that slowly, essentially, you know, goes into the freedom that they had. Even they were oppressed during the white terror years. They were trying to find any single way to to speak and create this music. Whereas that's the difference between China and Taiwan. And using that musical difference segue into it is really what is is a technique sort of for a set. Um, so technology and um, the bottom line is. Going into it is uh, kind of what Don Apps was saying is that there's Taiwanese Americans have a concerns like their own, right? And let's say recently um, President Mao Zedong was not allowed to go to Hong Kong, and Taiwan became a really big news. Um, but you ask the Taiwanese American, be like, yeah, you know, he's the president, he couldn't go to Taiwan, and those Taiwanese American be like, who? It's like, wait, so. So what if we can't go over? Is there something wrong? Like, they don't, they couldn't care less because as Americans almost, what impacts them is what happens in their, in their model in this American uh, society. Um, and similarly, it's, you know, the question is like, okay, let's say a lot of times the good segue people use now in, you know, these couple of months, I would say, is people are like, oh, well, what's the big point about Taiwan and China? You know, all Taiwan, it's, it's, it's not a big deal, right? But then with China building um, air bases in the South China Sea, then you know, we started to see um, China's in, increasing the sphere of influence. And then, well, that could impact the US. And a deterrent for that is essentially the East Taiwan by itself. And so that's Taiwan's the way to answer like, you know, why is Taiwan important to an American itself. Right? I mean, back in the 1950s and 60s, the U.S. did everything they could to keep Taiwan up. That also matters a lot about different localities, too. Uh, a couple of times, um, we talked to Congress a little bit. A couple of the people that in the Taiwan community have talked to, gone to Congress and talked to a lot of these like, senators and congressmen and congresswomen about Taiwan. And then we realized that, you know who the biggest supporter, what some of the biggest supporters are from? They're from Texas. You ask the Texan what they know about Taiwan, probably not much, but their parents probably work in a military uh, factory that, that makes the military equipment that gets set, that's been sold to Taiwan. And so that's the reason why Texans support Taiwanese independence, or rather the continued sales of military weapons. Um, First off, my head's are kind of ramble right now. I'm still trying to think of exactly how to say it, um, all this. Um, the biggest question that I like to say is that there's a huge difference between Taiwanese and Taiwanese Americans. Um, and the huge spectrum of things in terms of organizations. You have, you know, organizations, you know, like TAP, like TAP.org, that kind of getting these Taiwanese Americans to say they are Taiwanese Americans. Yeah, at least I'm pending that adjective to the American. But on the other hand, there are a lot of organizations in the States that are, um, if you have heard of, that are like, called FAPA, or like, um, a lot more hands-on activist groups where they're directly talking to the government about it. But then, sometimes they'll show, they'll be like, hey, you're Taiwanese American, you should care about Taiwan. We're like, well, there's so much to know about it. But I don't know about it. I, I, you, you can lecture me for four hours about Taiwanese history and politics. You're gonna tell me about congressmen about that afterwards? No, I can't even talk to the congressman about U.S. policy for a long time, right? So it's a continual learning progress. A problem that Jenny and I saw uh, growing up in college here was that Chinese Americans they they want to learn, as I said, they want to learn about it. But you and then, but at the same time, you have, as I was mentioning, 
not the opportunity to learn about the family or the cat, don't talk about it. Um, and you bring it to sometimes talk to the person that they know you're doing wrong, right? And so what they really want is someone close to them to understand them and song habit them, slowly bit by bit. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's what we're reaching out to a lot of Chinese American organizations, or schools around the nation, and essentially, well, Northeast right now. Really. Um, but essentially, the idea is that um, they they want to know about it. They don't know how to start start going about it. And then when they see someone that is not older, that is like them, you know, does the same activities, has the same hobbies as them, and they're like, hey, we learned about it. And suddenly, their interest in the Taiwanese history and politics is so much greater. And they'll be like, well, this is not propaganda. These are people like me. Like they were curious just as I was. And slowly through that, um, we kind of want to reach out to them. And we believe that the progress starts, this can start anywhere. We think we ourselves have experienced this college lack, this void of knowing more ability to know more about Taiwan. So we started there. I think it's, it goes to all ages, you know, and hopefully someday Taiwanese American parents will be able to tell their kids so that they, their kids will be the void of getting these Taiwan stories and develop their own identity through family and not have to rely on an organization travel around to tell them about who you are or about the history of who you are. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been up, I was up for a while trying to figure this out. So um, that's for the most part of what I'm saying. So well, well, maybe I can a uh, question that can help you focus this real quick. I guess my question is like politically speaking, what is the benefit? What is the end game as far as get, as getting Chinese Americans involved, or at least knowledgeable about it? What's what's the what's the point? Why? Well, why I mean, there's many aspects to it. Uh, one large part is. Um, we talk about great activist groups, we talk about a lot of um, talking to congressmen. Congressmen are going to get voted on, a Taiwanese person can't vote for the US Congress. A Taiwanese American can vote for the American Congress. So the idea is that everyone has their has ideas and topics that they want to vote upon. And it's important to know about your Taiwanese heritage because some of these congressmen, congresswomen, have this have an agenda. They, they want. They have a certain stance on the cultural issue, and so by getting Taiwanese Americans to really understand about where it is, or even Americans in general, that's why a lot of times people are like, I don't care. Like my almost every person I work with at work, they're not Asian. Either. And I'm still going to talk about it regardless because if I can get one of my friends, one of my coworkers who's you know Hispanic American, if he can be like, oh wait, this is actually pretty important, you know. And he talks with his congressman or congressman, and then it's like we have another digital vote. Because in the end, it matters. This is why um, I think it was nearly 20 years, 17 years ago, the census happened. And TimesAmerican.org pushed out a very strong campaign to fill out the census to say you're on Times America. Because if the Congress if the Congress knows that there is this group of people that exists, they will listen because their office depends on people. So the idea is essentially to get Chinese Americans to vote on uh, for Taiwanese, um, like pro-Taiwanese politics. Well, it's it's what aspect to at least think about. Well, right. I mean, because I because what you were saying before is that a lot of some of these senators, some of these politicians, what they represent, or at least what the people do, like people in Texas, it's like it's disingenuous. They don't actually care about Taiwan people. They care about their interests in Taiwan, right? So it's like, I remember uh, George W. Bush was pro-Taiwan because of uh, whatever reasons he had. But I was anti-George W. Bush, so I, I'm like, I can't, that's hard to reconcile. Well, I, I completely agree. So I mean, that's really on the, so as I was saying, there's a huge spectrum of organizations, right? So that's, on one side, there are very strong Taiwanese, 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 Taiwanese or Taiwanese American lobbyists groups and organizations that train you to do that. But honestly, I don't care. Like, I'm like I'm, as a growing up as Taiwanese American, I, I grew up in Taiwan, came here for college. Um, to me, if I was going to vote, I, I had a lot of friends tell me, like, oh, vote for so-and-so because they're voting for Taiwan. Like, 
No, there's a lot more US issues that I care about than Taiwan. So honestly, I don't care, but the, the but you want to think about it. I just want them to at least, I don't care about the political, I have no political agenda. I'm like, just know about it. At least, if you if you can tell me today that I have absolutely no interest in my Taiwan's heritage, then so be it. I, 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 I have met friends who be like, yeah, I'm Taiwanese American, but I really don't care about Taiwan. I couldn't care less. I'd be like, all right, we're done. I mean, I can talk about anything else. Right. But Taiwanese heritage, if you don't care, then there's no need to talk to you. But there's just so many people who are Taiwanese Americans that want to know about it, and then the best way is to say what it is. Yeah. Well, so if your agenda is not necessarily political, Alex, would you say that your agenda is more political in this realm? No, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, remember what you're saying is, it's like when you ask what's that, yeah, I think, I mean, obviously everyone has their own agenda, but I think with a lot of organizations and a lot of probably people who are activists in this room, you know, getting Taiwanese Americans to think about Taiwanese or issues related to Taiwan is an important thing, but in the end, it's, it's about responsibility as Italian Americans, you know, about this is something interesting that's happening in the world as a world citizen, especially as Italian American, I should know about it. Um, whether or not I'm going to be active about it in terms of lobbying or like going back and doing stuff actively, that's another story, and I don't think any of but he knows that he has the expectation that a lot of people are going to do that. But I mean, I don't want to like, I don't want to say like the end game is is just like to know about something. But when it comes to like American politics and things like that, like a lot of times it is. You know, it's politics in general and anything about the world. A lot of it is just like, yeah, I should be aware because it's an important thing. It's my responsibility as a as a to do it. I mean, I think the bottom line is it's just because. Like Bob said, like, call yourself Taiwanese American in order to get, you get challenged for saying that. And the bottom line, I don't think there's a political agenda for knowing about history and, and knowing about your roots. It's more about just understanding where you have your sense of belonging in this community. Well, I want to know that when I say I'm Taiwanese American, I mean, it means something to someone. People understand. Honestly, my name, speaking from personal experience, is that I can say that I'm Taiwanese American and no one's gonna ask me whether I like Thai food or whether <laughs> you know um, I'm Chinese or it's like are you sure you're a country or like some of the end game is that no one's gonna question my identity and I think that's the very least that any human human being can strive for is the so dream is for Taiwanese Americans to be as boring and as ordinary as <laughs> any other ethnic <laughs> American. Yes, completely agree. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Was a, yeah. Sorry, I just want to make a quick decision. But we're not saying that Taiwanese Americans have to care about the political issues of uh, their personal choice. Half of Americans, if they were to take a geography test, someone else can be saying today they would fail it. So we can our personal choice. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I. I'm talking a lot about the political stuff, it's just because that's um, a lot of times when Taiwanese Americans want to know more, that's really the. The only out there's, there's very few outlets to see it. And Taiwanese, when you learn about Taiwanese stuff, it's almost always politically charged. And it really sucks. Let's just say that. And so, um, yeah. When you add something to anything, um, I think on a more personal level, like So 
So like on a personal level, I mean, those are awesome. I don't know. If no, I think those are uh, that's that's certainly a uh, uh, noble cause, but it, it is like what you said, it is self actualization, right? So for a lot of people, it is coming to terms with it for themselves. Yeah, but, yeah. but this is kind of a discussion about actively, you know, uh, engaging, engaging people. You know, what, what we're trying to do is pre present an out, uh, a spot, a platform for them to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. There are like you know platforms to learn about. What needs to be. America, if you want to learn about the US history, there's this law, there's various laws up there. Mm -hmm. right? But there's a lot of times in America where you go like, well, I want to know why some people say this flag is not the Taiwanese flag. Mm -hmm. It's very hard, we've looked. It's actually <laughs> pretty hard to find any English material. Right. Because the bottom line is, all this debate is coming from, yeah, because Asia, Taiwan itself has this identity crisis. So the people would debate it, but it would be in Mandarin. But, if you want to talk to American, you'd be like, wait, wait, I know you guys are discussing it, I want to join, but language barrier, right? And so it's very important to, I think, to present this English outlet, that's easy to read, like, like uh, Taiwanese Identity 101, kind of thing, for these people to understand, at least start somewhere, determine for themselves. Because honestly, it's hard to form a decision when you don't even know where to start, when you have nothing, no basis to start on. I think the point I was just trying to make too is that if you don't know or understand the culture first, then it's not even a question of whether you're going to care about politics. Like, you, because you don't even know the country, you're not even going to, you know, like, if you're telling me because of some to the U.S. for the first time, like, you're not going to talk about Black Lives Matter and some Bernie Sanders. Like, you know, you're going to take them to a Broadway show and make them the Shake Shack. <laughs> you know, and just to give a, an example of what there is a prominent Taiwanese American journalist. She's Taiwanese American. She writes about Taiwan sometimes. She's in the mainstream media. And recently, I found out on Twitter, she was like, "Oh, what's about?" Like, I've never been doing my Now that is, she is forty-something years old, now Taiwanese American, she's never been doing my market. Like that just shows you the depth of. Uh, you know, are you going to talk to her about class regulations, legislative men? You know, she, the girl's never been to a night market, never had a bottle. You know, like, there is a lot of these groundwork that before you get to some of this. Yeah, no, I definitely think there's a lot of families Americans who, who need to, who are looking for something yeah. to, to, to sort of find their cultural attachment to. And it also seems like some. There are those who would just say Taiwanese American because it's something to say. Like, it seems like this person who's never been to a night market, I don't know, it's easy to say you're Taiwanese American but not really know what it is that entails, right? So, but then I, then, then you have organizations like, you know, TA.org and, and TAP, TAP New York are doing really amazing work about bringing Taiwanese people together, you know, in, in communities and forming them. So it's, it's, uh, it's it's really great that the, that these things that these organizations exist too because you are creating that community for people who a lot of people who didn't really have that and I I, I uh, you know within my own organizations I deal with a lot of the tap the tap people and the, really the the community that they form within tap it's it's strong like it's like really people who strongly identify with being Taiwanese American it's just something that. Uh, you know, often I grew up we didn't really have a whole lot of that. So, so that is definitely like something to, to be said. I mean, I think the, the, the large part is that um, when I first brought up the topic, we have to be able to talk about this. Immediately, I wanted to bring Tina or to tap in here because it's not a here's a deep end about Taiwan stuff, jump in there and learn the microscope. It's for the most part, it needs to be a self a self learning process where you slowly go from you might just start off with you know of course, the of America, eating a couple Taiwanese food, recognizing what you know where Taiwan is in, right? You just go slowly bit by bit, and then you can learn about uh, the history if you want. You can learn about the politics if you want. You can start asking about that if you want, but in the end, no one's there. No one should ever force you to do any of that. But there has to be a slow progression for it, rather than like. A, Here's what Bawa is, and go talk to me about this.
Um, if you want to learn more about Outreach for Taiwan, you can check out outreachfortaiwan.org. We're also on Facebook, Outreach for Taiwan. Um, I'm also a co-founder of the Carrot, and I'm also president. So if you have any interest in joining us, um, we host educational workshops at the University of East Coast, and um, we really strive to to hit that with the right way to learn at our like we. We're people, people like me. We, we're just like these kids that we go talk to. We graduated not too long ago. We know what it's like to be involved in the American Civil Association and want to learn more, but don't really know who to go talk to. So we got another person that's Any other questions about our talk or not? Or anyone else? Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
It's very like burritos. It's very like burritos. Yeah, you can say that's a Taiwanese version of burritos, but it's not. Oh, yeah, oh. Yes. yeah. I haven't had that. <laughs> but I mean, I think that, uh, uh, speaking to like, you know, I think a lot of people have the conception that Times Square is a very confident and maybe sometimes overly confident, but should not, like, honestly, the bottom line is a lot of like, Times Square is just completely clueless about what these mentalities. <laughs> Or like coming American, and so there's my advice to you know anyone like tell me if they want to talk to someone about like how he's working about Taiwan, just just tell them about it. And then if they are curious, they might act tough when they know everything, but they don't. Most of like uh, generalizing, obviously. Um, and it's uh, finding out where they are. Maybe they are like a rebel activist, and Taiwan is American, you never know. Or they might just be like, yeah, I went to. I've never been to a night market before. And then that's where you can start just telling a Taiwanese American the starting point for what it means to be Taiwanese American. Any other thoughts? I just want to add to the piece. One of my favorite sculptures of the piece and it's about the Japanese American. And I can't believe it. I think he's going to stay in Europe or something. Like, I hear about his story, I was very interested in that. He, he feel like he's, he might be in America, like, she doesn't feel like he's a like, 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 he's a and in, in the end, he feels like he feels like he's so he's an international man. He, he don't feel like he's a he say that he's an international man. But interesting that is that his words already like this is like the repeat for the nature is for and the rest for Western and I I just feel that it's a you don't have to really, because it's, you, you, you already is not a really from Taiwan or something. So you are also not an American, but it's something still very beautiful and very challenging. And I think that's, I think, I think that's the state I have to be You are just for yourself. You're not really for yourself. You are just for yourself. That's pretty good. That's such a nice way of putting it. And I would also add that as Thai Americans, we're so lucky that uh, our relation to Taiwan is like Thai Americans love going back. Like everyone who goes back is there loves it. People are saying that. You know, I know other, like my Indian American friends, my Korean American friends, they don't have the same relationship with their home countries. So I do think as Thai Americans, we are very lucky. Yeah. Uh, so I just out of curiosity, I know that um, Alex and Dot and Peter kind of all briefly touched upon traveling, right? So out of curiosity, how many of you are going to have kids in the future? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 May or may not have children, right? But then do you want them to continue to really care to understand this identity that you want and that you find so beautiful? Um, today we have not only TAP, we have more of but we also have more members of other organizations and community here today that have been on to speak up. One of which is Happy American Next Generation, Tang, and we have Jen Cow here if you want to speak about it. Quickly? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, our organization is called Taiwanese American Next Generation, and we're 
encourage your tours to have these on our uh, second generation youth, so people who grew up in the States uh, for the most part. Uh, and we, span, we started off as really just kids, um, like elementary school through high school, uh, but we recently added on a program for college kids and young families. And we also actually have um, this is really exciting, but an English adults program for basically second generation people that have kids now and they've grown up and now they're, they're, their kids are in third generation. And are coming in. Um, so that's pretty crazy. Yeah. But basically, what we try to do, which is it's really interesting when we're talking about this, um, is, is to foster pride in the community and um, basically self development. Um, and so it's a combination of both um, you know, discussions about identity, leadership, community, and that kind of thing, um, combined with uh, trying to teach them more about cultural stuff. Um, and that this is a very new uh, thing that we're trying to do, do specifically uh, different topics about different aspects of Chinese culture. Um, so, for example, this year we're doing Hakka culture, um, so we're trying to teach people about <laughs> <laughs> you have oh you we should talk. <laughs> um, so we're trying to do that in, in the future with like African stuff or like, you know, Japanese people in Taiwan or you know, different aspects of the Chinese history. Um, and Don, you had brought up this is more less about things or comments, but you brought up that like they're very interesting sources to discover our community. But I think that's better now. Yeah, but I'm very much discovering that because, you know, in our service to try to teach them about Hakka culture, it's actually been quite difficult because um, Hakka associations are almost entirely in Mandarin. I can't speak in Mandarin, by the way, so I can't communicate with people. Um, so yeah, associations are all, all in Mandarin, or they're all in Taiwan. Um, uh, articles, books, all in all in Mandarin. Um, and when I uh, actually reached out to like my community members, like my parents' friends who were Hakka or whatever, um, their experiences were really interesting too because they uh, didn't know much or like weren't allowed to talk about it, um, or you know like their parents discouraged them from telling all this they were Hakka. Um, you know, so it's it's been like a really 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 interesting experience and very eye opening and actually encouraging. That we should go out and see these resources you know, more young people about these specific things. Less, like, you know, we already know so much about food and stuff, but like, less about these, like, the nuanced parts of culture um, that apply. To, I mean, like, most of our campers are, are like, mixed, you know, on the, like, I recently discovered, recently discovered that my grandma was like, we're on the side of the age, and I didn't know that until, like, last week. <laughs> so, like, you know, this is applicable. To our kids, uh, but yeah, so this, this is what we're kind of trying to do. It's really hard to do that. So, so, yeah, I guess I can chime in for you. Like, um, I was kind of both of when saying we're part of the Chinese talks program, so we're the program director. And our kids are three to six year olds, right? You think they're little kids just running around and, you know, not really sure about anything. but. Last year, we sat them down and showed them an uh, outline of Taiwan. And they go, what is this? And they're like, oh, it's Taiwan. And then we were like, I was like, oh, tell us more about Taiwan. You know, and then oh, like, Apple Mama is from Taiwan, right? And it's just like really cute and like just put dot into like that community, that identity, that people go on. It starts at a really young age, and it's very important to kind of nurture that and to enrich it and to just let these kids know that this identity, that this community exists, and we're all here for you. And then you are going to grow up in this community tonight. Which I will forget that. So, um, yeah, so Tang happens every year for the Shadi weekend. Yes, I was a definitely jumped in. I thought this was out. Thank you. That's why she wants you to have kids. Because it's always American next generation. Well, like, not only that, though, uh, some of my campers, their parents were, are involved with the community. So, for several years, I've been involved with the United Nations for Taiwan movement. So, some of my campers, their parents, Used to spearhead this rally that now I am personally spearheading. It's just amazing how this comes full circle and it's very emotional, very beautiful, and I think it's been like the experience. Which I guess kind of leads over to the United Nations for Taiwan movement. Has anyone heard of it before? Great. So in the New York community, um, for several years, there's this movement 
been telling my nation's for how long it's been. It's also called the Chicago Parade. Um, but basically, it takes place every September with the United Nations General Assembly. And basically, kind of um, raise awareness about how it's going to be If any of you are interested in partaking in that, you can reach out to me as well. And we can work together. Um, next, we have Felicia Lynn in the house, and she has something to say as well. Thank you. <laughs> 